Today we're talking about shape. Perception of shape moves from general to specific, from the overall pattern to the details. This is how your vision works. Your retina is constantly taking in an overload of raw material. The raw material of visual experience is dealt with in your head through your brain creating a corresponding pattern of general forms. Vision is a creative act. Because our eyes are spherical in shape, it means that when we take in visual information, if our mind didn't do the job of processing that information correctly, what we would see would be an amorphous world viewed through a fish eyes lens with objects that we know to be straight appearing rounded towards the edge of our vision. But that's not how we see the world. Our brain is doing a lot of heavy lifting in between taking in that raw data and processing it in, into usable information. So how do we see shapes? With Western and specifically Renaissance painting, the idea of shapes being the outer boundaries of what you see of an object from a particular vantage point came to be the main way of talking about shapes. But we can see in this painting by Mantegna, the dead Christ, that if we adhere so closely to these rules about perception from a fixed vantage point determining the shapes that we see, then the resulting shapes that we produce on the picture plane are ones that do great violence to the actual shape in terms of the way that we understand it as a concept. The Egyptians didn't have this problem of worry over working from a fixed vantage point. As we can see in this reproduction of the palette of Narmer, the reason that Egyptian drawings look the way they do is because in their depiction of the human form, they have selected the shapes that will do them the greatest service when portraying these characters. So we get the profile view of a face, we get the front on view of a torso, and the side view of arms and legs. No body actually works in this way, but it's immediately apparent what's being represented on the picture plane, because the concern here is for visual communication through shapes and not so much the dependence on reproducing the projection of shapes from a particular vantage point. Once Western painting moved beyond this ideal of perspective, modern painting moved into a world that could embrace effective use of shapes once again. Here's a painting by George Brock, the model, and in it we can see that we're given both the front and side view of our model's face at the same time. He's giving us multiple perspectives of objects at once in order to give us the most direct reading of the figure. While the painting of the Dead Christ by Mantegna is a masterpiece, this painting by Brock is more direct in its, in its visual communication. The shapes used in this composition exist on the picture plane and are instantly readable by the viewer. Verbal cues can affect the way that we see shapes. Here I have a circle and I'm going to add a rectangle. If I add another semicircular shape, this might start to resemble something, but if I say the word apple or orange, then your perception immediately shifts. What was once a collection of three shapes placed on top of each other now becomes an abstract image. It takes no time for us to recognize these three lines and two dots as a face. This is your mind organizing information 
in the most simple manner possible. Perception is a creative act. The Gestalt psychologists say that the basic law of visual perception is that any stimulus pattern tends to be seen in such a way that the resulting structure is as simple as the given conditions permit. It is more difficult for us to see these shapes on the screen as separate. The easiest structure for us to see them in is a single unit of a face. This happens immediately. So the idea of simplicity is really important when you're dealing with shapes. So let's talk about shapes. Our simplest of shapes is the circle, a single line that connects in on itself. Children will often use circles when they're beginning to draw and they won't actually make the boundary of the circle, but they'll scribble out a circle from the inside out. They're building a unit. The circle can stand for many things. It can be a body, it can be a house, it can be a wheel, it can be parts of a body. If we place this circle far off in the distance on a horizon line, we might even be able to recognize this single circle as the figure of a human. The second simplest shape is an equilateral triangle. The smallest number of straight lines used to create an enclosed shape. The triangle is a stable shape. If you push on it from any direction, it cannot collapse in on itself. The Eiffel Tower is constructed out of a series of interconnected triangles. Triangles represent stability. Think of the pyramids in Egypt. This is a structurally sound shape. The next most complex shape would be a square then, just moving up in the number of sides. And this pattern will continue on now, simplicity doesn't necessarily come from the smallest number of parts, but rather from the structural features. Here's an arrangement of four black circles. We can see within this arrangement, even though one doesn't exist physically in front of us, we can see a square. That is the simplest structure available to us. Here are examples of other structures that you might be able to see. All of these images, the canted square and the face on the right, contain these four points, but the simplest arrangement of it is the one on the left. This is what you're going to perceive. If we add four more dots to that, we might perceive this either as a octagon, or more likely even a circle, because once again, the circle is the simplest shape. In this example, you might see three white circles or white squares that meet at the intersection of these lines. The circle and square does not actually exist in front of you, but it's something that you perceive nevertheless. Here we have an example to illustrate this idea that simplicity comes not from the number of parts, but from its structural features. Here are two different designs. They both contain the same number of parts, a square and a circle of equal size. The design on the left is more complex than the one on the right, because in the one on the right, the shapes maintain a central location to each other. Organizing structures in the simplest possible way is called orderliness. We might also think of this as an economy of means. Here are some drawings by Albert Durer of pillows. Now we think of shape generally as being the outer dimension, or the outer edge of an object. 
here Durer has laid out the outer extent of these pillows. But he's also done something else. All of the lines that are drawn on the inside of the pillow act in multiple ways. They tell us about the light striking the pillow and where shadows lay. They tell us about the volume of the pillow. The lines move along with, with the bulge of the fabric as they crisscross the item drawn. These lines that exist on the inside of these pillows are called cross contour lines. The contour is generally thought of as those lines that you see making up the outer edge of the pillow. But there are also contours that exist that move across the pillow. So these lines tell us about light, they tell us about volume, and they tell us about the outer dimension of the pillow all at once. This is orderliness. It is what's called an economy of means because he's achieving multiple things with one motion. Distance has a simplifying effect on us. In a study done in which the participants were shown this shape, after a matter of time, they were asked to recreate the shape in drawings. You'll see examples of these recreations, and there are two different ways that the test takers responded. They either simplified the shape through various means, and this simplification of the shape is a tendency towards a stylistic choice that we can refer to as classical. Think of the Parthenon in Athens or the Pantheon in Rome. These are examples of classical architecture. Simplicity and symmetry reigns. On the other hand, sometimes the participants exaggerated differences in this design when they recreated it. This is a tendency towards a style that we can refer to as romantic or expressionist, where differences are expanded upon and symmetry is reduced. Here's that drawing again on the left, and here are the reproductions that the test takers created. You can see on the top line where they enhance the symmetry. This is more of a classical response. In the middle, They've isolated a non-fitting detail. This would be a more of a romantic or expressionist response to it. Again, when the overall shape is simplified on the bottom row, this is an example of a more classical response. And we'll see some more varying attempts at recreating the image here. So the distance of time is one in which generally simplifies the shapes that we perceive. If we take a look at this figure, and we're asked to reproduce it after a period of time, it might pose a few problems if we perceive of it as a whole unit. But in fact, even though this shape is filled in entirely with black and is therefore unified in that way, the simplest way to read this shape is as two shapes laid on top of each other, a triangle and a rectangle. That is the simplest means of organization for the design. Here's an example showing the ways that subdivision can be enhanced or reduced depending on the type of format that you're working with. If we take a square and divide it down the center vertically, we can still perceive it as a whole here in figure A because the ratio of the sides of one to one is still solid. It's still solid in our minds as a whole unit. In the center, in drawing B, we have a format that's referred to as a tatami. This is a format that's made up of a ratio of one to two. If we split it down the center vertically again, this tends towards a stronger subdivision of the shape. We no longer perceive it as a whole that's divided, but as two holes, two whole squares placed next to each other. This doesn't play true for all sorts of rectangles. Rectangle C is an example of what's called a golden mean rectangle, which is created through what's called the Fibonacci sequence. We'll learn more about this, but it's essentially one, one, two, three, five, eight, 
13, 21, 34, 59, and so on and so on, in which you take the previous two numbers in the sequence and add them together to get the second or to get the, the following number. This produces a ratio of 1 to 1.618, and this ratio is found all over nature. Because this ratio is something that we are so used to, whether or not you're aware of it, it is so intrinsically everywhere that if we divide that rectangle down the center, we still perceive it more readily as the whole format divided rather than two units placed next to each other. Here is a drawing of a sculpture by Konstantin Brancusi called The Lovers. There is a subdivision created straight down the center in the sculpture, but here the sculpture still holds together as a single unit. This is obviously what the artist would want if he's creating an image of two lovers intertwined, the metaphor being that they are one unit, one whole person. Subdivisions and differences are only effective when there is similarity involved. We talked about this in the last lecture with the idea of unity and contrast. This is the same thing that we're talking about now. In this design, all of the units unify through their tone, they're all dark, and through their shape, they're all square. Through that similarity, their differences become more apparent. So there's a subdivision between size taking place here two larger squares and four smaller squares. In this design, there's a large triangle and a large circle, a medium-sized triangle and a medium circle, and a small triangle and a small circle. All of these are dark on a light field to help unify them together so that their differences, their subdivision in terms of shape becomes more apparent. Here we have all the same shape, but their tonality is what's creating a, the division, the contrast. Here, proximity is used to create subdivisions within the design. You can have the same shape, but with different orientations in terms of its positionality. Here we have three vertical rectangles and three oblique rectangles. Direction and speed can also be used to subdivide otherwise unified elements so that the shape remaining the same as what's allowing you to see the difference. Here are five triangles. As we move from left to right, there is a modulation that's taking place in which only the rightmost point of the triangle is being moved from top, middle top, to middle, middle bottom, and bottom. We organize these shapes in our mind in terms of their axes. Triangle A contains strong vertical and horizontal axes. So does triangle E. While triangles B and D contain strong oblique or diagonal axes, and triangle C contains strong axes that subdivide it in half. Let's take a look at this painting by Peter Bruegel the Elder, The Blind Leading the Blind. Here there is a similarity in shape, a human shape, that is repeated six times. There is a modulation in the direction of that shape taking place. A simplified diagram might look something like this. This is how visual communication works, how unity and contrast is created. There has to be a unifying effect, similarity shared, in order for contrast to do the work of communication. Let's take a look at your homework. Studio problem number five, using narrow dark lines in a square format, create a unity of size with a variety of shape. Create 10 thumbnails and 10 variations with your final mounted design. This was a rather quick lecture. I hope that you're reading along in the required reading 
that has been assigned, there's a lot of information that just isn't transmitted the same way in terms of the, these virtual online video lectures versus what we would experience in the classroom. I've been pleased with most of the work that I've seen in terms of your studio problems, but I would ask that we start to get serious about presentation. Presentation is literally all that we have when dealing with art and design. If your borders aren't even, if you're not cutting straight lines when you cut out your final design, you need to work on that. Your sketchbook, your portfolio should be the best representation of your work possible. And that can only be accomplished through strong presentation skills. If you have any questions, email me.